So let me ask kind of a, an artificial intelligence engineering question. So you, you've been an outspoken critic of, I guess what could be called intelligent design, which is an attempt to describe the creation of a human mind and body by some religious folks that religious folks used to describe. So broadly speaking, evolution is, as far as I know, again, you can correct me, is the only scientific theory we have for the development of intelligent life. Like there's no alternative theory as far as, as, as far as I understand. None has ever been suggested and I suspect it never will be. Well, of course, whenever somebody says that a hundred years later. <laughs> I know, it's a, it's, it's a risk. Uh, it's a risk. But, um, you want but, to bet? I mean, I, I, I. But it would look. Sorry, yes, it would probably look very similar. But it'd be. It's almost like uh, Einstein's general relativity versus Newtonian physics. It would be maybe um, an alteration of the theory or something like that. But it won't be fundamentally different. But okay. It, so uh, so now for the past seventy years, even before the AI community has been trying to engineer intelligence, in a sense, to do what intelligent design says. It, you know, uh, was done here on Earth. What's your intuition? Do you think it's possible to build intelligence, to build computers that are intelligent, or do we need to do something like the evolutionary process? Like, there's there's no shortcuts here. That's an interesting question. I, I'm committed to the belief that is ultimately possible because I think there's nothing non-physical in our brains. I think our, our brains work by by the laws of physics. And so it must in principle be possible to replicate that. In practice though, it might be very difficult. And as you suggest, it might, it may be the only way to do it is by something like an evolutionary process. I'd be surprised, I, I suspect that it will come, but it's certainly been slower in coming than some of the early pioneers thought. <laughs> thought it would be, yeah. But in your sense, is the evolutionary process efficient? So you can see it as exceptionally wasteful in one perspective, but at the same time, maybe that is the only path to- It's a paradox, isn't it? I mean, it, on the one side, it is deplorably wasteful. Yeah, uh, It's fundamentally based on waste. On the other hand, it does produce magnificent results. Um, I mean, the, the, the design of a soaring bird, an albatross, a, a, a vulture, an eagle, um, is, is superb. An engineer would be proud to have done it. On the other hand, an engineer would not be proud to have done some of the other things that evolution has served up. Um, some of the sort of botched jobs that you can easily understand because of their historical origins, but they don't look well designed. Do you have examples of oh, bad, well, bad design? <laughs> my favorite example is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. I've used this many times. This is a nerve, it's one of the cranial nerves, which goes from the brain and the end organ that it supplies is the voice box, the, mm -hmm. the larynx. But it doesn't go straight to the larynx, it goes right in, down into the chest and then loops around an artery in the chest and then comes straight back up again to the larynx. Uh, and I've assisted in the dissection of a giraffe's neck, which happened to have died in a zoo. And we watched the, we saw the recurrent laryngeal nerve going whizzing straight past the larynx within an inch of the larynx, yeah. down into the chest, and then back up again, um, which is a, a, a detour of many feet. Um, very, very inefficient. The reason is historical. The ancestors, our fish ancestors, the ancestors of all mammals and fish, um, the most direct pathway of that, of the equivalent of that nerve, which, there wasn't a larynx in those days, but it, it innovated part of the gills. The most direct pathway was behind that artery. And then when the wow. mammal, when the tetrapods, when the land vertebrates started evolving and then the neck started to stretch, the marginal cost of changing the embryological design to jump that nerve over the artery was too great. Or rather, was was each step of the way was a, was a very small cost, but the marginal, but the cost of actually jumping it over would have been very large. As the neck lengthened, it was a negligible change to just increase the length, the length of the detour a tiny bit, a tiny bit, a tiny bit, each millimeter at a time didn't make any difference. And so, but finally, when you get to a giraffe, it's a huge detour and no doubt is very inefficient. Now that's bad design. Any engineer would reject that piece of design. It's ridiculous. And there are quite a number of examples, as you'd expect. It's not surprising that we find examples of that sort. In a way, what's surprising is there aren't more of them. In a way, what's surprising is that the design of living things is so good. So natural selection manages to achieve excellent results. 
um, partly by tinkering, partly by coming along and cleaning up initial mistakes and, and as it were, making the best of a bad job. That's really interesting. I mean, it, it is surprising and, and beautiful. And it's a, it's a mystery from an engineering perspective that so many things are well designed. I suppose the thing we're forgetting is how many generations have to die. Oh yeah, for that. that's the inefficiency of it. Yes, that's the horrible wastefulness of it. So yeah, we, we, we marvel at the final product, but uh, yeah, the process is painful.